but I don't agree, all right? Tolerant indecision, all right? Maybe later that person hears the gospel again, maybe they'll come back around. Same with violent hostility. Or saving acceptance, you know? It's, it takes it takes a lot of times. So where was it? I think I read it a little while ago, R.C. Sproul, one time when he was sharing the gospel somewhere, he told some woman, he said, let me just share this gospel with you. And she said, I've heard it a thousand times. And he shared it one more time, and she understood it. She broke down. She got saved. Her life for all eternity was changed, okay? Amen. So just because we get the first two things happen doesn't mean we stop, okay? we got to love the people enough that we're going to keep on sharing the truth with them, all right? And I started off with the purity of the church, all right? This is a hard passage right here in the Bible, but this is uh, church discipline is what it talks about, okay? And we're also going to see that this is a highly misquoted subject right here because some folks uh, quote, you know, where two or three are gathered, but they forgot where it was in the passage of Scripture. It's right there in the area of church discipline. <laughs> yeah, it's, not a, uh, it's not a pleasant thing, but it should be a pleasant thing because what does the Bible say? It says in Hebrews, that whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. So if God loves you, he'll correct you. And he'll keep you going on the corrected path. And it's the same with the church. We ought to be correcting one another. But once again, always with love and gentleness. So if we see somebody doing all kinds of crazy stuff, and they claim to be a born-again believer and a follower of Christ, it's going to tell us right here how we deal with it. It says, verse 15, Matthew 18, it says, If your brother sinned, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. So success. Great things have happened. It should be something you praise God about. All right? But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. All right? So that says one other person. All right? This isn't like the gossip thing, like you tell everybody and then you go to the one person. All right? You go, you grab one other guy after you talk to the guy and say, hey, can you talk to, me? Can you talk to this brother with me right here? Let's try to help him out. All right? And the reason that's in caps isn't because I was trying to, like, yell at you guys with or something. It's because it's the same thing as in the Old Testament and Exodus. When you look at your Bibles, a lot of Bibles will have all caps in areas. That means that it's reciting it from the Old Testament. So it's not just a New Testament thing. It's an Old Testament thing as well. And it says, verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now, remember back then with the Jews, you know, if you weren't Jewish, during the gospel time, you weren't Christian. You weren't a follower of God, okay? There was, a, there was a few proselytes of people that would come to the Jews and become a Jew and follow and things, but most of them weren't. You know, outside the Jews, nobody was a God follower. They were all pagans, okay? So when this was written in the gospel, something about all the pagans, so be, let him be as a pagan or a tax collector. A tax collector was the biggest thief you could find. It's a guy that pretty much had a... He had to pay the government some money, but how would he get paid by whatever he collected on top of that? So if he was a real rich tax collector, you know that he was really collecting a lot of money on you right there. And people did not like that at all. We wouldn't like it either. All right, so here it says, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Another verse that a lot of times is taken out of context. Look where it's talking about right here, about going and talking with the brothers and things like that, trying to get people to follow the right way. And it says here, Again I say to you, if... Two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. All right? So God's involved with it too. When you go to talk to somebody, God's right there too. And God loves us enough to discipline us and guide us on the right path. And believe me, who needs discipline? Every single one of us needs discipline. Every single day. Okay? If we think we don't need discipline, then we're falling into the sin of self righteousness. We're all broken. We all need to be corrected every day by God, and we should want to be corrected by God. To be in a place of, of I guess the opposite would be submission or, or non-submission, okay? To be in a place of, uh, of self, like I'm perfect just the way I am, nobody needs to tell me anything, that's, that's pride. That, that's the opposite of humbleness, the opposite of meekness, okay? Let's say Moses, most humble man that ever lived. You know, we got to try to be like Moses right there. We've got to live in submission under the authority of Christ and his scripture. We talked about saying Sunday school a little bit. We said that a lot of people, they break the first few commandments because they make a God of their own making. They're like, my Jesus wouldn't do that. My Jesus is like this. Well, if your Jesus contradicts the Jesus in the Bible, 
He's a fake Jesus, and he's not a Jesus that can save you and lead you into heaven and to eternity. Okay? We've got to always realize that our Jesus is the Jesus of the Bible. Okay? And, uh, and that's where we have to submit to. And we can't just take parts of the Bible and throw it away and say, I don't care, that's not my Jesus. It is indeed your Jesus. If you don't, maybe it's not, because maybe you don't have Jesus. If you're looking the wrong way. We've got to look to the Bible as who Jesus is. The Bible describes who Jesus is. And I wrote on top here, too. I put, the Lord Jesus wants total commitment, okay? He wants us to be sold out to Him. It's not just a partial thing. It's not just a sometimes Jesus. It's not just a Sunday God. Total commitment. I think I said it before. I don't want to overstate things all the time, but it had a big impact on my life. It was one time I was in the Army at Fort Bragg. I had to go to one of these mandatory meetings because that's how they make sure people are there, things they make it mandatory. And uh, it was a CIA agent who'd had his master's degree in theology, maybe a doctor's degree in theology, and he would go into other countries, and he would tell other countries, he would try to build a rapport and a connection between us and the other country. And most of these countries were Muslim countries. And he said he would go there, and he'd draw this little diagram out, and he would make a picture of the center and write God. And then he would make, like, you know, uh, he'd make uh, uh, eating, family life, you know, uh, work, social, whatever. All these little circles had branched off. And he would say to the guy, he'd say, I understand that you as Muslims have God at the center of your universe. Your speech reflects God. Your actions reflect God. The way you dress reflects God. And he said, though I disagree that we have two different eternal destinies, you and I, you know, because we don't believe that you know, Muslims are going to heaven right there. They have a false God right there. He goes, I can respect that God is at the center of your universe. He said, unfortunately in America, and he made the picture, he erased God in the center, and he wrote self. And God was put off on one of the side things, you know, like church, God, family, different things. But self was at the middle. He said, this is unfortunately the way most Americans are, but not ones that are real Christians. He goes, I'm a real Christian, and God is at the center of my universe as well. And he governs every action, every thought, everything I do comes forward from God first in the center of my life. And that's the kind of commitment that God wants us to have to him, all right? False religions have it, some of them, and that's a terrible, sad thing right there. You know, because they're, they're like a, a slave in bondage, you know. They're, they're breaking their back and it's killing them. Yeah, I, I talked to many of Muslim men, old guys that were, you know, nice guys. They weren't trying to kill me or anything like that. And they said, I said to them, I said, if you died today, would you go to heaven? And they said, no, no, I don't think so, because my sins have not been balanced for you. And these were old guys already, you know. They probably died, probably some of them are already dead. It's been some years now. And they didn't even know. And why? Because they were being honest. They really did feel sin. They felt the wrongness, and they knew there was no justice paid for them because they didn't have their faith in Jesus Christ. We have our faith in Jesus Christ, and when he died on that cross, he paid for every single sin we ever committed, ever would commit, completely covered, 100%, salvation secure. You know, it could have been like, uh, I guess you could probably make some kind of art picture, and to understand it better and make a picture of a cross and write your name in it along with everybody else's name who's ever going to go to the kingdom of heaven was secured that day on the cross in full, okay? Those poor Muslim guys and all these other false religion fellows that don't believe in saved by grace and grace alone, that they're earning their way to heaven or something, they're, if they're honest with themselves, they're going to know they're not going to make it to heaven because we can't ever make it to heaven on our own good works. It's all what Jesus did on the cross. So it was a pure church. That's the way the church of Acts worked. They were, they were filled with grace. They were filled with love, and they followed after the Lord. Okay, They were secure in their salvation. And here we start the passage. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. It says, How many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles? Now many signs. It says not how many. Now many signs. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. All right? So this is some serious New Testament power. All right? 
People were all coming out to the streets. People were laying the sick out. Imagine you're sick in, the, sick in your house, and you hear that the apostles are in the neighborhood. They're like, come on, get him out there. I know he's broken, and he can't hardly move, and he's dying. But get him out there to the street where these guys pass by that maybe they can get healed. Because they had that kind of faith, because they'd seen it happening all the time. All right? We don't see this happening so much today, right? And I'm going to tell you some reasons why I think we don't see it happen so much today. is because today we have the Bible. We have the Word of God. Back then, they had the Old Testament scriptures. It wasn't common to everybody's hand, okay? It was common to, like, the rabbis and things. Not everybody had their own copies of the scrolls. And then they did not have the, 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 the church, you know? Everything developed yet. It was just starting to develop. So what did God do? God gave miraculous signs and wonders and different things. To, to speak out, almost like a loudspeaker, like, hey, here's the Lord, follow me. You know, these are things that happen with God right here, right? Now, today we do have some that say they have this, but would God really give them all these miraculous powers with bad theology, okay? Because a lot of these churches that are claiming all these things have some serious theology flaws when you look at the theology, all right? Theology is a study of God when they, they say, well, God is this, God is that, and they... It's all mixed up, and it's not what the Bible says about it. Do we really think that God is going to be blessing them with all these miraculous powers and supernatural things if they're not even following what Scripture says about God Himself, okay? So that's something that we, we should think about when we see that. And I think about it all the time. I, you know, I, I've been fooled myself by quite a few things because you hear somebody and they say, Oh, I saw this happen, I saw that happen. And, and then you ask them, like, Do you really saw that? No, my friend did. My friend told me about it. And then if you go to the friend, the friend will be like, oh, it wasn't actually me, but I heard about it from this other person right here, and it's kind of a, a, a fool's goal type of way, okay? And the way I look at it real quick for bad theology is most of these folks that claim all this present-day healing powers and different things also claim to be prophets and apostles, which I believe was for the first century gifts right there. And it says in the Bible, in Deuteronomy 13, that one false prophet... Prophecy makes you a false prophet. In fact, back then they were supposed to kill the guy right on the spot. That's how bad of a sin it was. It was like a sin that was so bad it deserved death. It was one of the 37 sins that deserved capital punishment back in the day. And that God never changes, okay? And yeah, now we're in the age of grace. We don't have all these capital punishment sins that kill us, unfortunately, for God's grace and forgiveness. But it was still an issue, and it still is an issue. If somebody has a false prophecy, they're not a real prophet. You shouldn't be listening to what they say. Because it's like a, a drop of poison, a drop of arsenic in a glass of clean water. It'll kill you just as quick as looking at some uh, muddy, swampy water with a whole bunch of poison in it. You know, you just don't see it there. But if you see this false prophecy, run away, okay? And know that, yes, God is capable of healing people. God still does heal people today. But it's not done on the kind of level that it was back then. I mean, we don't ever see people coming out to the streets and everything when somebody walks by and all these people getting healed. All right? If anything, with those guys that claim to do this, you see guards standing there making sure that nobody who doesn't have some kind of psychosomatic disorder issue that their symptoms are coming from actually gets to come up to get healed. You just see a bunch of people that have some kind of issue that nobody's going to be able to tell if they were healed or not. You don't see a guy with Down syndrome or handicapped or you know broken or missing legs or arms or something like that actually being brought up to be healed by these guys. And that's because they have bodyguards that separate all that kind of stuff, but you don't even know about that while well, it's raking tons and tons of money, some of them millions and millions of dollars at everybody's expense, which is a horrible thing. But as we move on here, we're talking about angels here too, all right? And angels are still just as real as they were then. Angels are all around us. It says in 5.17, it says, But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, which remember I said before they're Sadducees because they don't believe in the resurrection, they don't believe in angels. They don't believe in anything. They believe you pretty much just live, you die, that's it. They were like deists. You know, God made us and he went far, far away. And they were filled with jealousy. So they were super jealous of the apostles and everybody was bringing them out and coming into the streets and listening to the apostles. They were filled with jealousy. And it says, it says, and they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. Okay? Imagine what the public jail was like then. Sure it wasn't nice. <laughs> All right, sure it was not a nice place. It says, but during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. All right, so isn't this amazing? These guys are put in jail because they're preaching the gospel. And the main reason isn't because they're doing something wrong. It's because they're jealous. 
Okay, the Sadducees, all the religious people of the day who were supposed to be somebody were really jealous because no miracles were happening in their, in their church, in the temple. No, no wild things were going on. People weren't changing. People weren't flocking to them. It was just like a same old, same old thing with the temple, okay? But here they were jealous. They saw what was going on. And what happens? It's almost like ironic. Is they don't even believe in angels, the Sadducees, all right? They were like the main political party in charge. It was like the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the scribes. They were all part of the Sanhedrin. They were the main political party in charge, the main guys in charge, and they didn't even believe in the resurrection. They believed when you would die, you were worm food. There was no more, okay? And they don't believe in angels and spirits and all that kind of stuff. And what happens? God sends an angel into the prison to get these guys out of the prison, all right? And notice, too, it says apostles. This is probably all 12 of the apostles, all of them, including the new guy, Matthias, that they selected, all right? So it's not just two of them this time. All the apostles are sitting in the prison, and an angel shows up, and he gets them out of the prison, all right? And right in the middle of the night. And then what does he tell them? He doesn't tell them, now, run for your lives and get away from these guys. He says, go right back to the temple and start your preaching again. Go right back to what you were doing. That'd be a pretty scary time right there. Imagine, you just got thrown in jail, and we don't know how bad this jail was. It wasn't a nice thing, I bet. I mean, a little whipping was 39 lashes that killed some men. <laughs> All right? So he throws him in the jail, and then what does the angel tell him? He says, go back to the temple and start preaching again. He tells him, don't give up. Don't run away. You know, this is what you are to do. And even bigger in this passage, what we can see, it says to him, he says, he says in verse 20, Go and stand in the temple and speak to all the people all the words of this life. Okay? What are the words of this life? If you look in your translation, some of them call it the gospel. Okay? All the words of this life is the gospel. They're to preach the gospel. They're to preach that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, that he was God Almighty, came down in the flesh, and that he died for their sins, and that they could repent and have faith and be forgiven of their sins and live forever with him. That's what they were to go to do. All the words of this life, all right? That's a big deal right there, okay? He told them to go and preach the gospel. And we should hold the gospel as a big deal as well, all right? All the words of this life. That, that's, 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 that's beautiful right there. This is what the angel told them. He said, that's what he wanted to do. This was the main purpose, all right? And he said, when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach them. They were obedient. They heard it, they went, and they did it. And I wrote up here that when we look at angels, several times, I didn't write down the verses, but several times in the book of Acts where angels show up, they free people out of prison, not just this time, but some other times too. They encourage people at times, okay? When they're down or they're out, they tell you, it's okay, get up, you know, get back on your path right there, their encouragement. And also they execute judgment. Think about Herod. When Herod, King Herod said that uh, the people started saying, oh, he is like a god. Right away it says an angel of the Lord came and, and hit King Herod as he was filled up with worms and died on the spot. So God killed him through an angel right there. And if you look in the Old Testament, there's one place in the Old Testament where one angel kills 185,000 enemies right there in the Battle of Sinatra. It's even located in secular history. If you look in secular history, they have found that all these guys just suddenly died. They didn't say an angel did it right there, but they were trying to go up against Jerusalem, and the guy prayed, and God answered his prayer, and in the middle of the night, God killed 185,000 men with one angel angel, all right? Think about the, the angel with the Ten Commandments, you know, with, uh, when they, with the Ten Plagues. When they broke that Tenth Plague, God sent an angel, and he killed the firstborn son of every single person who did not have the blood of the Lamb on the door right there, okay? So angels can do all kinds of things right there, but angels are servants and ministers of God, and we're not to ever worship angels or look to angels for any answer whatsoever. We're to look to Jesus for the answers. Jesus the Master. The way the way it works, it's like the military, all right? In the military, if you need to get something done, you don't go over to some unit and find a private or some lowly fellow and say, hey, I would really like you guys to come over here and help us out. That would be like insubordination. It would be totally wrong. You would go to the head of the unit, to the colonel or somebody, and say, hey, can you guys come and support us and do this? That's the way it is with the Lord. We don't pray to some angel. We don't look to angels for any help at all. We look to Jesus for help. And Jesus sends his messengers to help us at times, okay? So we've got to be careful we don't fall into angel worship. That's a bad thing that goes on today as well. We don't exonerate angels or anything. In fact, in one place in the Bible it says that there will be a time when we will judge the angels. Us. 
will judge angels, is what the Bible says. One day when we're in glory right there. And it also says that the angels look to us in surprise sometimes as an anticipation. Like, what are they going to do? What's going to happen now? And that's, uh, that's something that the angels are seeing and when the angels are all around. And I, I, it makes me think of that, too. I was thinking of it recently. I've been doing a lot of reading lately, and sometimes reading is very boring. And I'm like, man, this is boring to do all this reading. But then I look around at life, and I think, you know what? Would I rather be somebody that's involved as part of the story or just somebody that's just bored all the time and doesn't do anything, okay? I'd rather be part of the story. And sometimes to be part of the story in life, it means getting in there. It means doing stuff right there. It's like these apostles. They were in there, and they were preaching it. They were doing what they ought to be doing. And I want to be part of that story. I don't want to have a book written, and they say about me, well, I was just a guy that kind of sat off to the side and... We didn't feel like doing anything, just watched it all, just looked out for my own comfort, ate some good meals, and uh, got a lot of sleep. All right? I don't want that to be said about me. I want to be as part of the story. And in order for us to be intertwined as part of the story, like any book we've ever read, it doesn't start off like right with action right away. Usually it starts off real slow, and then all of a sudden you're in this middle of this giant plot, and all these things are going on. All right, That's the way life is, too. For us to get in there where the plot is and all the stuff going on, we've got to be an active participant in life, okay? And for us to do that the way the Lord wants us to do it, we need to be involved in sharing the gospel and following Him and being active with the Lord. Not just mentally ascending to it, but physically ascending to things too by following after Him. Alright, and then it says, uh, this is the gospel as well right here. That's a great gospel passage. I put this in because I thought, you know, we talk about sharing the words of life. I want to show you what some of the words of life are, alright? 1 John 1, 1-4 to says, What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our own eyes. It says, And touched, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Okay, who's the word of life? It's Jesus. And life was manifested, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life. Okay, every one of the apostles physically saw Jesus. Paul was the only one that wasn't. And Paul was vouched for it by the rest of the apostles. It says, which is with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. So how's your joy going to be made complete? By sharing the gospel with somebody else. By sharing these words of life. That's how you really get joy in your life, okay? And that, that's, that's what these guys are talking about too. And it's about the gospel and about the word of life. And what the angel said? Share with them all these words of life, okay? That's what he said. Now we go back to Acts 5.21. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported... We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors. And when we opened them, we found no one inside. Okay? Imagine how these guards, these guys probably felt. They're like, good, we're dead men now because the guys escaped. It was our job to watch them, and they escaped. All right? Well, laws and punishment were much stricter back then. Okay? They didn't have prisons overflowing like we do. Pretty much you got killed all the time if you did anything wrong. Prison was a short-term sentence before you got killed right there. All right? So here we see that the, they're gone, all right? And they came, and he told the, the high priest that, you know? He told these guys, like, hey, we searched it all. The guards are still there. The doors are still locked. We don't know how they're gone, but yet they were gone. It's a supernatural miracle, okay? God showed, an angel showed up. God sent an angel. Angel took them out of the prison, and nobody even knew about it, okay? These guys are gone out of the prison, and they went to go find him to put him on trial that day because they arrested him for the trial, and they're not even there. It says in verse 24, Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. All right, like I said, probably fearing for their lives. All right? And someone came and told them, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. So they're looking like, where are these guys? They're right underneath their noses. They're already at the temple. And they're preaching to everybody the same message that got them thrown into jail in the first place. All right? And they run right away. They're like, whoa, look at this. I mean, that's probably look is like a huge word of excitement. Like, oh my gosh, look. Look, there they are. They're right there. <laughs> they didn't run away or anything. They're right there. So it says, then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. So at this point now, think about the, how much, 
how much affluence that these apostles are making here. Okay, what's the church like? 3,000, maybe 5,000 strong now, we've read. All right, there's all these people starting to follow the Lord. People all dragging their sick or dying people out to the streets whenever they walk by, just hoping that Peter's shadow would fall upon them, that they could get up and walk and be healed because they'd seen all these things, as they saw power. They were listening to the message about Jesus Christ, about all these words of life. And we went and we saw what are the words of life that Jesus came, that he died for us, and God was manifest in the flesh. And now, and now, they're afraid because they know that if they go to get these guys roughly, they're going to get killed now. The people get stand up as a riot and start stoning them, throwing rocks and stuff at them and be like, hey, don't you dare harm these guys. This is obviously the truth. And these are the guys arresting them who are supposed to be presenting them the truth. This is the church. This is the temple that was supposed to be God's servants, God's priests that were to bring them all these words of light and it wasn't coming from them anymore. They were full of jealousy and they were the ones trying to take them. And they were so scared that they had to do it real gently to go get them. You know what? The apostles went with them. Okay? It shows a lot of obedience here. They didn't say, oh no, come on people, don't let them get me. No, they just went right with them. All right? So they followed obedience right there. And, then, and guess what else I wrote here? The temple needed the gospel. All right? I mean, the temple, this is where the most holy stuff is supposed to go on, and this is where they were told to go and preach. They weren't told to go down to the gutters, you know, where the tax collectors and maybe the prostitutes and all these kind of people were. They were told to go to the temple to preach the word of God, all right? And think about this, too. When we read about Jesus, Jesus two times in the scriptures thrashes the temple. Once in the book of John, in early time we see him thrashing. He goes in there with his whip and he cracks it. He turns over all the tables and shakes up all the money changers. And then once again, in the week of Passover, before Jesus came in to go die, you know, he came in riding on a donkey, right after he came in riding on a donkey, and they're all praising him, he just starts ripping apart the temple again because it's going back to the way it was. So we know Jesus' ministry was like three years. So in three years that Jesus was doing his ministry, two times he thrashed the temple. So the temple wasn't some place of holiness like it should have been, all right? And this is the second temple, too. And eventually, God let this temple be torn down to the ground. In 870, that temple was gone completely, and it still hasn't come back yet. If you watch the news and listen to it, Israel always wants to bring this temple back. But it's at the Dome of the Rock. And if you watch the news now, they're talking about the Palestinians possibly taking over part of Jerusalem. And maybe America being fine with it. Let's hope not. But I'll tell you what, I know one thing is the Bible is the Bible, and the Bible says that there's going to be a third temple again one day. All right? So I know those things. And it also talks about Israel. It talks about Israel as that God is never going to abandon his people. And they look forward to a literal kingdom. So I don't think that's ever going to happen. All right? But who knows what's going to happen in between time right there. But we can see all kinds of craziness going on. So here it says to him, 527, And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charge you not to teach in this name. And then, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Okay? So they're like feeling guilty now. They're like, they're preaching Jesus, and he's the Messiah, he's such a great guy, and we were the ones in charge of making sure the Romans killed him. All right? So they're like, you're trying to put the blame on us. What are you trying to do? And he's like, we strictly told you, do not teach in this name. They did. They told him back in chapter 4 when we read, when they were already you know, roughed up a little bit and everything before. He said, don't you dare do this. And they still are doing it. So they're telling them, we strictly told you. This wasn't like a maybe. This wasn't like you could use a thing and say, like a play on words or something like that, you know, and say, I can get out of it. You know, it, could, it wasn't like a lawyer thing where lawyers can sometimes take things and if they're not legitimate enough, they can twist it around and say, well, it wasn't clear, so the guy's innocent. They were like, no, everything was totally clear to you. You were not to preach the name of Jesus. You were not to keep doing this, and yet they did. And it says, But Peter and the apostle answered, We must obey God rather than men. Okay, that's that is huge right there. Really big, especially in this day. All right, in this day right here. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. So, they, bam, they were worried about bringing the blood on him. He just brought the blood right on him right there to the, to the head of San Peter and Council. All right? It says, God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. All right? Some people talk about a second baptism in the Holy Spirit. I thoroughly believe that if you are saved, you've been 
baptized in the Holy Spirit. You can't be a believer. You cannot obey unless the Holy Spirit has saved you. Unless you've been saved by the blood of Jesus, then you have full power in Jesus. And how does that demonstrate itself? By obedience. Because what does it say? Whom God has given to those who obey Him. If you obey God and you're following Him, likely you, you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit, you've been saved, and you're well on that path right there. If it's just a mental ascent and there's no obedience, and no Holy Spirit, then there's no salvation either. Okay? we got to get the full package. You don't have a package at all right here. And, uh, and that's just exactly how the saved are described right here. All right? And this thing about how he says, he goes, we must obey God rather than men. We have to be very careful with this. Okay? We don't just whip this verse out like it's nothing all the time, okay? We don't, like, uh, do some illegal thing, like maybe be at work, and you're supposed to be working and doing your job, and instead you're preaching Jesus, and they're like, hey, I need you over here. And you're like, no, no, I've got to finish this conversation right here. I must obey God rather than men. That's not the right thing right there, okay? When you're at work, you're paid to work. You're paid to do what you're supposed to do. By all means, you get an opportunity to share the gospel. People all sitting around on a lunch break, coffee break or something, by all means, share it and speak it right there. But this doesn't mean that we can just use this as some kind of a verse all the time whenever we want to break the law, do whatever we want to do. All right? There's many times in the Bible it talks about in the book of Peter, it talks about it in Titus, it talks about in Romans 13, that we're to submit and obey to the authorities. Okay? Even back then, oh, back then, I mean, Caesars and stuff, you read some stuff. These guys were some vicious, evil people with terrible moral standards right there. But yet it said God placed them in authority and that we were to obey them, all right? And that's what we're supposed to do until it comes to the point where they're going to cause you to sin, all right? When they're going to cause you to sin, when they're going to cause you to stop doing what you should be doing for the Lord, then you have to disobey them and you have to obey the Lord. But this has to be taken with very clear conscience right here, okay? This is a big deal. This isn't a small deal. When you decide to disobey the authority... You better make sure that you're really being obedient to God. You better make sure you're really being led of the Spirit to disobey the authority. You're not just doing it on your own, okay? Because truly, the whole Bible has a lot of stuff with authority in it. We're supposed to be submissive to the Lord. He's our authority. There's all this authority over all of us all the time, okay? It talks about a man having authority over a woman. Women are supposed to submit. But then we even see Jesus submitting to the Father. And then we see in Philippians how he was equal with the Father, but yet he was in submission to the Father, okay? So there's all this authority all over us all the time. If we hate authority, probably we got an issue with pride in our life. And if we got an issue with pride in our life, we're going to do all kinds of rebellious, terrible things, and it's going to cause a lot of trouble. So we can't let that happen to us. When pride's coming up in our life, what do we got to do? Humble ourselves and say, please, Lord, sorry, please, Lord, please forgive me, save me, Lord, help me to go in the right direction. You know, if you already saved you, know, I say, save me, but Lord, help me go in the right way and help me to follow after you, okay? So we got to be very careful with this part about obeying God rather than men, okay? So we are to be in submission to a lot of things, even the secular government, until it goes against the law of God, okay? So maybe, like, here's an example, maybe if they told you you're a pregnant lady or something, like China, you know, what's going on in China is terrible. They're changing a little bit, but now they're allowed to have two kids. Well, the woman gets pregnant with a third kid, and they're like, we're going to kill your baby. You've got to go kill your baby. Well, for her to obey God's better than man. She's not going to go kill her baby because she knows one of the Ten Commandments is thou shalt not murder. Okay? So it's not going to happen right there. And that's kind of extreme. We're not to that point in America. But when they, if that kind of authority comes that way, we've got to pick to choose God over man. Okay? Fortunately in America, we're still very blessed. We always complain. We see how bad things are getting and everything. We're still very, very blessed compared to the rest of the world. We can still gather here today, worship. We can say whatever we want to say. We can read the Bible how we want to read the Bible. We're very blessed today, okay? There's other countries that's not so blessed, right? There's other countries this stuff really is going on and people being martyred and killed all the time. All right. Romans 14, 19, as in with my obedience I was talking about. You know what it says? It says we should pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. That's what we should be pursuing. We've got to be careful not to be on the disobedience thing, but we look for peace. If you read Romans 14 and Romans 15, it talks a lot about peace. It talks about like if one brother thinks that he can't eat this, well then don't eat that around that brother because you're causing him to sin because it's a big deal. If you eat it, sure. It even says if you have the stronger faith, 
you who knows more, that's fine. But don't do it in front of this guy who had sinned to him. You know, it's talking about keeping the peace, all right? If somebody has an issue with someone, let it be. Don't make a big stink about it. Don't, don't bring it to the point where you're like, you're not even saved, man. You're not saved because you're eating that fish, all right? You can eat all the fish you want, really. But, but I'm just saying, whatever they do, we've got to be looking for peace, all right? The two biggest things in the New Testament, if you look where they fought against peace, was two things. is who is Jesus Christ? If somebody doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is part of the Trinity, you know, part of Father, Son, Holy Ghost, that He's Lord God Almighty Himself, that He is the Savior, that He's the Messiah, then that's a huge issue. You know, that was called upon for like uh, bad talk, huge fights and everything. Read the book of Galatians and things too. And then that same with the book of Galatians, the second thing they taught about that would make huge fights was if you believed you were saved by anything other than grace alone. If you believe that your works could save you, or that grace plus your works could save you, like the Jews, the Jews all thought, you know, that all their works and good deeds and stuff would earn them into the kingdom of heaven. Galatians destroys that, all right? He calls it anathema all the time. Anathema, anathema, I may say it the wrong way, Greek word, but that means to hell with this doctrine, to hell with this teaching. That's the kind of, kind of obnoxious hatred they went against it, and that's okay because those are the apostles, and that's so we should we should stand strong in those things as well too. Who is Jesus, and how are we saved? That's go to war, foundational stuff with the brothers and sisters. Okay, don't want to go to war in a mean way. It says to do it in gentleness and love, but it means you bring it up. Something about eating something or some little issue, don't even bring it up. Let it be. Be friends with the person. Keep the peace. Peace is very important in the Bible. Okay, so we got to let some things go. And we, we can't always be the one that's right, all right? That's hard on a lot of us. Pride gets the best of us all the time. When we want to be right and everybody else is wrong, I tell you what, I see many a man who doesn't go to, don't, they do not go to any church at all because no church follows the gospel. No church is good enough for them. No church is good. And they'll tell you that. They'll be like, I just can't find a church. Every single church has got all this messed up stuff. Well, I guarantee you they've got even more messed up stuff in their life. Because they're not perfect. None of us are perfect, all right? We're all trying to submit. We're all trying to follow God the very best that we can. So some guy that gets to that point that he can't even find a church to go to, he's got some real issues in his life right there. You should pray for that guy. You should try to bring him into our church. Bring, you know, bring him into some church right there, encourage him to go so he can be with the body of Christ and they can help him out. Because none of us are meant to be out there on our own some right there. And obviously, he's got a real issue with this, building peace, because he's no peace builder if he's at war with everybody, okay? So we got to try to build peace all the time. And I only say this because I don't want you to go the wrong way with the do not obey thing, okay? You don't obey when people tell you to sin and go against the Lord right there, okay? All right? 533 or 37, it says, When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them, all right? What did they just hear? They heard them say that you killed the Lord our Savior, the Messiah. His blood is upon you, okay? That's what they heard. They just heard the direct accusation straight to them saying, yeah, you're, they said, you're trying to make us guilty of this. And they're like, you are guilty for killing the Messiah. That's basically what they said. So they got angry, and they said they were enraged, and they wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while, okay? This is a good peacemaker, what this guy is, all right? He stops. They're all wanting to kill him. He says, oh, put those guys outside for a little bit. Let's talk about this, all right? And he was an older guy. This guy was so respected that when he died in uh, 18 years before the fall of the temple, they said the law died with him. Everything died with him. I mean, when he died, they just thought they lost everything right there. In fact, he was known as the Rabban. Not rabbi, but they called him Rabban which means like teacher of teachers. This was the master. That's what Rabban means. That's who this guy was. He was extremely special. He knew a lot of stuff, and he stood in, and he made the peace. And what does he say? He says, he says, and he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Thaddeus rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. That's not the same Judas that we know about that followed Jesus, okay? So here, he's telling them, he's like, hey, if these guys are really something, then what they'll do is last. If not, it's not going to last. Now, is this true? 
That's not true either, all right? He wasn't the smartest guy, but, you know, he was a well-respected guy because we know that the Muslims have been around since, what, the year 600, okay? Jehovah's Witnesses have been around for uh, 150 years, but really you could track them all the way back to the year 300-something with Constantinople, with Constantine, with Arian, who tried to change the whole doctrine and everything, and that's where the doctrine of the Trinity was set in place with the same thing that they believed, okay? So there's false doctrines been around for a long time. The Gnostics which is what the epistles of John slam so hard. All right, if you read the epistles of John, it slams a lot of false religion type things. The Gnostics are still around today. All right, if you ever saw that movie Noah that they came out with with uh, Russell Crowe, that's a Gnostic movie. Everything about it's Gnostic. It starts off in the beginning where Adam and Eve are like ethereal. They're not really there. They are, but they're not. I mean, that's all going to a Gnostic doctrine. That whole movie was made from a Gnostic's point of view the whole way through, and it's still around today. So is it true? That just because some doesn't last, that, that's the test? No, some things still do last, okay? But this is just the guy speaking. But he is going to say some truth. We got some good truth coming from him, okay? He's not a man that misses all truth right there. We got some good truth coming, all right? But one thing, too, we can see here, the church is absolute and it cannot be stopped, all right? That's something that's in the Bible as well. Like I talked about Israel, how Israel's not going to disappear forever. So is the church. The church is going to stay all the way. You read about the church all the way to Revelation chapter 4, and then you read about it again in Revelation chapter 19. Okay? The church will stay. Nobody can stop the church. Many people, famous people, have said, by the time I'm done with it, no one will have a Bible anymore. No one will believe. No one will go to church. It has not happened, and it will not happen, because God is in control, God is sovereign, and God's church will continue to thrive and continue to grow. And in fact... Which is a sad thing. I hate looking at things this way and saying it. You know, because like I said, we're not nearly as bad off as what some countries are. But when the church gets persecuted, they grow. Good things happen to the church when they suffer. When bad stuff goes on, if they were to start telling us, like, hey, you can't preach the Bible, or you can preach, but not these passages, and we're going to tell you the passages you can't preach, you better believe we're still going to preach those passages. That'll be a thing where we obey God rather than them. And then all of a sudden they come in, they arrest some of us, or they do terrible things to us. I guarantee you more people will be like, wow, those people did it anyways? And these guys went to jail and somebody else stood up the next week and did the same thing? It'll start to grow. Okay, that's what happens. When they persecuted the church in the first century, it started with Jesus. Then it started with his 12 apostles. And then it blew up into millions of people. And it's nationwide, worldwide now. The church is absolute. It's never going to go away. It can't be stopped. All right? And this guy, Rabban, okay, the, the, like I said, Rabbi Rabban, he was a pragmatist. He was just looking for the practical things, okay? So practically he said, well, if they're good, if they're fake, then they'll just go away like everybody else went away. But he was not a biblical scholar, okay? Because if he was a scholar, you could look at some other things that have been around a long time. I bet you Baal worship was still going on in places right there, all the way back from the time of Moses. I know it's still going on today. There's a lot of Satanism and terrible stuff going on today, just like it was back then. So it says in 38 to 42, it's the end of the passage here, getting close. It says, so in the present case I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. Which is true indeed, eventually it will fail. You know, fail when we die and go forth with judgment. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. Which that's true as well. You might even be found opposing God. All right? So I wonder if maybe this guy was being convicted. I don't know. We don't ever read in the Bible, was Gamaliel saved? Did he come to be a Christian? We don't know. But he was on to something here, okay? He was on to something. He said, you know, if you're opposing these men, you might be found opposing God. So they took his advice. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. Now, what did I say about beating them? 2 Corinthians 11, 23 tells you what the beating is. It tells it's 39 lashes is what it was. That was the beating, all right? Men died from being whipped 39 times. This wasn't like your paddle time. This was a time of horrendous things, okay? Paul was beaten five times, 39 times, okay? Imagine what Paul's back looked like. He mentioned one place in the Bible where he says, I bear the scars of my Lord. He bears the scars of things. I mean, his back was probably just just rough as rough could be. Like, you see some guys in Africa or some that, like, tattooed himself or made, like, weird things with, with punching holes in themselves, and you'd see these huge scars. It would have just been a complete scar all the way over his back. And I bet some on his lower legs, his butt, probably his neck, maybe even his face. Because I'm sure these guys weren't experts at every time they lashed right there, okay? I'm sure it was a rough way. And here it says, Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing 
wait, wait, maybe I'll skip the verse here, okay? You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice, and when they had called the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So once again, they said, don't speak in the name of Jesus anymore. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Now how many of us, honestly speaking, if somebody just whipped us 39 times, would be able to start rejoicing and thanking God that we were getting to suffer for Him? All right? Maybe after some time it might happen to us, but I don't know how many of us are that mature right now, right today, that that could happen to us. But these apostles were. They were hard charging. We ought to be too. We ought to be trying to get to the same standard as well ourselves. That when somebody persecutes us, somebody here in our country, they use some bad words against us or calls us a bunch of bad names or something like that, and we get all in a fuss about it, we should be praising God, saying, Thank you, Lord, that I'm getting persecuted. Thank you, Lord, that they hate me for your name's sake because they hated you. Thank you that I get to share in the persecution that you had, Lord. That's how we ought to be. And, and these guys are being whipped. I mean, imagine one of us was whipped. I tell you what, I'd be fighting back right away. All right? <laughs> I don't know how these guys could sit there. Maybe they held them down. But still, these guys rejoice when they suffered, okay? I mean, they went to God and they're like, thank you, Lord, okay? And you know what it talks about in the Bible, too? It says when you suffer for him, you're building up rewards in heaven. So if you think about it, if you earn a work good job, you make some money or something, you're like, oh, my bank account's a little better. When you suffer for Christ, your bank account in heaven's a little bit better. What does that mean? I don't know what the bank accounts in heaven mean, okay? But I know it's a lot better than any bank account here is going to ever mean, all right? And I know those rewards that we're building up in heaven are wonderful rewards, okay? So when we suffer for the name of Jesus, it's a good thing. And what do these guys do? They praise God. So maybe that's what we ought to do, too. Instead of getting all sorrowful and all upset, we should be praising God and thanking Him that we were worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. We were kind of worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. All right? It's pretty tremendous stuff here. It says that every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. So what did this whole trial do? It just made them worse. All right? It made them more fired up. Now every day... They're going to the temple to preach. Every day they're going house to house to share Jesus Christ. Okay? They followed the advice of the angel. When the angel said, hey, get up and start preaching the words of life, they did it in its entirety. And now, and then even these guys, who maybe they'll save their backs, but you know, he was probably hoping, man, I sure hope they run away now. They were still right back at the temple every single day. It was nonstop. All right? They all did get killed eventually, all right, except for the Apostle John. But they're wrote down in the history books. They're in the story. Do you want to be in the story? I want to be part of the story. All right? So let's try to be part of the story today. Because God is still just alive and working today as he was back then. All right? I said maybe not so many miracles and things going on. Because now we've got the New Testament in the Bible. But you standing for Christ, you being changed by God is a miracle in itself. All right? John 3.19 says, so, so here's the answer to what happened to those guys when they saw all that stuff went on. But this is what happened to them. This is what happened to Gamaliel, Mango 2. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. Did you notice the Sanhedrin in this story never talked about how did you get out of jail? I mean, that was probably a criminal offense as well too, right? If all of a sudden you were put in jail, you're supposed to be on trial, and now you're over here hanging out in the temple preaching, that probably would have been executable by death as well. I mean, today, we watch these movies. I don't know what the real law is, but when we watch a movie, and like Shawshank Redemption or whatever, and the guys are trying to get out of jail, the guards are trying to kill them, okay? That's like an executable offense. We don't even see that as part of the trial here. Why? Because they wanted to wish-wash it all the way. Like, we don't know. That's such a mysterious thing. We don't want to admit that there's any angels. We don't admit that there's any supernatural power, and they just ignored it, and they looked the other way, all right? But they saw it. They knew what was going on. The Sanhedrin, who didn't believe in any spirits or anything, knew something supernatural happened because they knew they were locked up properly. The guards, everything was still proper, and yet these dudes were out preaching. But they loved the darkness more than the light. They loved their sin more than they loved God. And that's really where it always comes down to. Do you love your sin more than you love God? And I tell you what, often, many days, we probably do. Many days, we probably find ourselves choosing sin over choosing God. And when we realize that, what should we do? Repent. I'm sorry, Lord. Forgive me. Help me, Lord. Help me to go the right way and the right path, okay? Every single day, we ought to be doing that. And we should be loving God more than we love our sin. 
And that's what the Bible says too. John 3.19. This is only three verses away from John 3.16, okay? I tell you, I think I might want to memorize the whole chapter of John 3. So when people try to misuse John 3.16 as if everybody's saved and we're all going to heaven, I could read the whole chapter. Man, could we have some theology talk about that. And I tell you what, John chapter 3 shows a lot of stuff in this one chapter. This is only three verses later. And so they already made up in their minds the Sanhedrin. And they didn't even want to talk about the escape. 2 Corinthians 2, 15-17 says, For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. So were the apostles, so is every one of you who is a believer today and you share Christ with somebody. You're a fragrance. You're something beautiful to God. You're like a good aroma to God's nose. It says, To the one, an aroma from death to death. Those Sanhedrin are people that don't want to believe. You're just preaching stuff that they hate and they're going to hate you even more. They don't want to hear it. Okay? To the other, an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? For we are not like many, peddling the word of God, like you see on the TV evangelism oftentimes, these guys saying, just send me all your money. Send me your money today and you'll be healed. Send me your money today and you'll get to go to heaven. Those guys, most of them are probably not going to go to heaven themselves, okay? Those are some false teachers doing some false things. And they usually... In our time and day, they are very much identified by money, okay? <laughs> when you see these guys, multi-billions of dollars, and they're people poor, you know, or regular or whatever, like us or whatever, there's an issue to be had right there, okay? There's a serious issue. It says, it says, but as from sincerity, as from truth from the heart, but as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. And that's how we're to speak. We're not speaking for money. We're not speaking for any other thing. We're not speaking for anything except because we love Jesus. What did Jesus say? He said, if you love me, you will obey me. Okay? So we see a lot of stuff obedience here. We do see some disobedience to the government when they try to tell them to quit preaching Jesus. They try to shut them up. It goes on today subtly in our culture. In our culture, it tells us, hey, keep your faith in your private prayer closet. We don't want to hear it. Keep it to yourself. You can be whatever you want to be, but I don't want to know what you are. I don't want to hear about it. All right? Now, I could care less if somebody tells me a bunch of crazy things. It's not going to upset me or hurt me. In fact, it's going to cause me to have some passion for them and some love for them. And I'm going to want to share with them the right idea and the right truth and tell them who Jesus is. I want to talk religion with them. I want them to bring it up. I don't want to be kept in some private prayer closet because otherwise how am I ever going to show him some light? And it's not going to offend me or hurt me at all because I know the rock I stand on. I know that the Lord God is one God. I know that there is no other God. There is no competition for God. But now I see this guy and I think, man, that's the guy lost in darkness. I'd love to talk to him about that. All right, so we shouldn't let it get shut up in a private prayer closet. And we can see consistent evangelism was the pattern, all right? And in conclusion here, Evangelism is the only thing that can't be done in heaven. If you think about it, in heaven we talk about the church, how great the church is, and I love that you guys come to church. I hope you all keep coming to church. But here in the church we have encouragement. We can feed on the word of God. We can pray with one another. We have a lot of great stuff. But you know what? That's all going to be in heaven too. We're going to have the same thing in heaven as what we have right here already. But what we're not going to have in heaven is any lost people. There's not going to be anybody who doesn't know Jesus Christ that we get to share the truth of God with. This is the only time in history that the part that we dwell in where anybody's going to get to hear the gospel from our mouth that's not saved. All right? So evangelism should be the consistent pattern going throughout our lives. All right? Billy Graham, he preached the Lordship of Christ. You know, he preached repentance and things too. And many thought that there would be less of a response. But actually, there was even more of a response. You know, sometimes I say, unfortunately, sometimes the Billy Graham Crusades, you know, they have like thousands go down on front to get saved. Do I think all thousands were saved? No. Okay, because I've seen it myself in many places where everybody comes forward to get saved, and then next week at church, same people are there, nobody different, no other churches that got these people in it either. So was that really real? No. But you know what? At least it drew a response from them, okay? They, they heard it, whatever. And that's what we should be doing, too. We should be preaching. And really, it's the Holy Spirit that draws the response. It says in John 6, 44, that no one can come to the Father unless the Holy Spirit draws him. That's why we say, you're sitting here today, you're not a Christian, or if you are a Christian and you're an heir or something, and God is convicting you, it's not me, it's not your head, it's God, the Holy Spirit, personally drawing you and convicting you to draw him closer to himself. All right? God delivered them from prison, but not without a whipping, okay? Many times in life, it's not going to be like I, like I have in my visitor books. I have a picture of uh, It's a Wonderful Life by Ray Comfort, but then it says in the myth of the modern-day message, there's a picture of a dude getting stoned to death right on the front of it, okay? 
That's how often it is, all right? And look at this. God sent an angel to save him out of prison. He didn't stop him from being whipped 39 lashes, all right? I mean, these guys went away with scars for the rest of their life from what happened to them. Could God have stopped it? Yes. Did God stop it? No, all right? So there's going to be some suffering involved on this path at times, all right? And how important to us is the gospel of Christ and the honor of his name? Is it important to us enough that if we got thrown in jail and all this terrible stuff happened, we would be right back there doing it? It should be. If it's not, it's something that we need to be praying about and uh, working on there. Now today, we got Communion Sunday, and I got away from my computer, so I talked longer than I thought it would. I thought I had a short sermon today. I'm sorry. But here, here in Matthew chapter 28, verse 17, what does it say? We're talking about all the apostle stuff. So when they saw him, they worshipped him. This was after the resurrection, okay? Jesus had come back after the resurrection. Now he's in his glorified body, been walking through walls, eating food, disappearing, reappearing, all this kind of stuff. And what does it say? It says, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. This is talking about the apostles. These same guys right here, this, we're, they're a little more advanced right now, so we're talking a little bit later in time. Some of them doubted, okay? Do I doubt sometimes? Sometimes I have a little doubt and I think about things. You know, I thought about it this last week. I thought, because sometimes I think, well, I'm never going to doubt, I'm never going to doubt, and you fight that, but sometimes you should explore it and think about it. I doubted, and I thought, it, and I thought, you know what? What if there wasn't a God? What if, what if all this isn't real then? And then I thought about it, and I thought, but how, how did we come to be? How is creation here? How is our world the only place in all of the universe that we've ever found life? Okay, we've got like that Hoover telescope or something out there so far. I don't even know if I can imagine how far out it is. And they can't find any light anywhere. It's all just right here. How is everything so perfect that we would live the way that we live, that we have breath, that we have, that we, that we have seasons, that we're not like having massive floods all over the world or massive ice age or, you know, fire falling from the sky or stars or things. How is it all this keeps going on? Isn't that amazing right there itself? You know, people think, well, I just came off from all primordial slime when I was evolutionized. How is it that the heart worked without the brain? How did the brain work without the, the, the liver, or the, the, the stomach, all these things? What came to be first? How could it just pop into just the right place, all right? It'd be like as silly as saying, like, I took a whole bunch of kids' alphabet letters and just threw it on the floor, and there was the Bible. And all of a sudden, I realized what it said. It doesn't make any sense at all, okay? You want to see a great movie? Maybe this is where I started thinking about these things. The Atheist Delusion by Ray Comfort. It's for free. You just type it in on YouTube if you got internet. If you don't, I'll get you a copy maybe. But it's for free. And he goes through these kind of things. But how did the words get on these books? Somebody put them there. So we can see all these ways that God exists. All right? And then we can also see, I mentioned it today. I read it. I read it. Is uh, Think about a little boy. And he's got himself in a lot of trouble. And he's going to get spanked or he's going to get in trouble. Maybe he lied to his parents or something like that. And the little boy is looking at a leaf. And as he's looking at that leaf and the little veins in that leaf and stuff, he thinks, wow, who made this leaf? And I wonder if they, he has rules too, just like my parents have rules. Will he discipline me and punish me the way my parents discipline me and punish me? And that's a good thought, right? And that's a good, it leads to good basic conclusions, all right? With the world today, we've got so much garbage out there, and really the answer all comes down to millions and millions and millions of years. And then when you show them something else that doesn't make sense, millions and millions and millions of years. It's like that's their mantra to try to make everybody think that it's all just accidental. We're not accidental. It's obvious we're not accidental. And then if you look at it, if you look at Christianity, every other religion has a bunch of guys, like I said, those old Muslim guys, that are just trying to weigh out their good from their bad. And they know they're never going to do it because they never are going to do it. Jesus was the only one who could die and pay the price for our sin in full. The penalty was paid in full. When he died, he said, it is finished. It's done. Okay, it says in the Bible, too, that all those whom he called, or those whom he justified, or those whom he glorified, as if it was in past tense. Like I said, your names are on the cross right there, from all the way back then. It also says in the Bible that he who he starts a good work in, he will finish it and complete it. All right? And those are things, too, that we don't just believe part of the Bible. We believe the positive parts of the Bible, too, that God is in us, God saved us, God's going to keep saving us, and God's going to see us all the way into glory. So is it bad to doubt? It's healthy sometimes to doubt. I don't say healthy. It's natural. It's a natural man. It's a sinful thing. It's where things try to pull us apart. But then we just got to do a reality check. Like I just told you how I did a reality check. And I started thinking about all these things. I thought, 
That's just impossible that God doesn't exist. It says in Ecclesiastes 3.11 that God placed on the heart of every person a sense of eternity. Every single person. Okay, so that, and it says in Ezekiel, that little phrase, a little bird told me, that's from the book of Ezekiel right there, okay? So you can tell the person, that's a phrase people use today, a little bird told me that you're not telling the truth, that you don't think you're going to live after you die. I know that you know that you are, and then you can help them see it. But then what does it say in that same passage? I like to read some in context. After he said, some doubted, that Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So what did God do? Came and gave them assurance, helped them out. They were doubtful, he assured them, he helped them, and he told them what to do. So told them to go be part of the story, okay? Let's make sure we're part of the story this week and in our lives and throughout. Now we're going to take communion, I'm going to pray. And we got to think about it. every time we take communion, it fits well with the sermon and stuff. We are 